Good evening. I whispered to Donna on the way up, see, Jesus is keeping you on your toes. That's an easy segue into Joshua chapter 18, because the Christian life is designed to keep us on our toes. Joshua 18, verse 1, how many of us are learning that the Christian life is not a carnival ride into heaven, but it's a battle, it's a fight. The exciting thing is the Lord wants to partner with you to do his work, to bring about his will on planet earth. And I pray that we're entering into fully possess you know, the inheritance that God is giving to you, uh, to us, but I pray that you are fully entering into the inheritance that God has given to you, just like the children of Israel, as we're in this section of Joshua, and we come back into it again tonight. Remember and never forget, the Lord has an inheritance for you. And those, of course, as we read our New Testament, are those heavenly rewards, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. There is such a synonymous tie to what we're reading about here in Joshua to the Christian life. And I, I pray we're laying up for ourselves an inheritance that's glorious. As you ref uh, reflect Christ in, in every area of life, as you're faithful to what he's called you to do, it's as simple as that, right? making disciples of everyone that we have opportunity to, preaching the gospel not in a legalistic, burdensome way, but as the Lord provides opportunity, man, we take it, we're not going to miss it. Amen? Thank you, Father, that you keep us on our toes, because I'd stick with the carnival, cotton candy. Who's been to the fair recently? I haven't been this corn dogs. You know what I always I think about the big turkey leg, but of course they have better things. Crazy deep fried this and deep fried that, funnel cake. The Christian life it's it's not a carnival. There's plenty of treats along the way. I'm kidding with you a little bit. Father, we come to you in prayer in Jesus' name as we sang. What a privilege to sing this praise to you tonight to come together with your people, Lord, our brothers and sisters who love you. God, to have those watching and joining us online. God, wanting to be, longing to be, but can't be. Unite our hearts together in our gratefulness for grace. Lord, our trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Let us be a, a people who are continually praying, preparing, Lord, posturing ourselves so we can be sharpened by you. But Lord, help us also to raise that shield of faith and protect ourselves from the fiery darts of condemnation that come from Satan. And I, Lord, I just think there's someone here tonight watching or listening who's just suffering, who's being beat to death with condemnation. God, help them discern the difference. Help them discern the sound of your voice, the voice of a father, a perfect heavenly father. You're not intoxicated. Lord, you're not out of your mind like earthly fathers can be, abusive to your kids. You teach us that so plainly. The heart of that father to the prodigal son, that's you. Lord, help us to abide in your love tonight, to discern the difference between the voice of the Spirit, a gentleman, speaking words of conviction, Truths that will sharpen us and better us, Lord. A difference, God, between the voice of Satan who just wants to keep us from anything and everything good, to rip us off, to starve us spiritually, to ultimately kill us. God, help us to discern the difference. Lord, and whoever that is tonight, Lord, just speak words of grace and love and mercy to their heart. Point them back to the blood of Jesus that we say is enough, but God, we've got to trust and believe that though we stumble, Lord, though we're imperfect, God, it's, it's still, just as you say, it's enough. Lord, it's washed us forever clean, white as snow. As far as the east is from the west, Lord, so far have you removed our transgressions from us. God, they're gone. The handwriting that was against us, Lord, 
God. It's all just a race that's removed. There's now no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father. Minister, Lord, that wonderful grace to, Lord, our hearts tonight. And Lord, equip us to serve you, God. We live in a a day and age, a time in which there's so much opportunity, Lord. We just see opportunity everywhere we turn. Just like Israel, God. A whole country, a whole kingdom that you had given them. And you said, go and get it. Possess it. Take ownership. Enter into your inheritance, Lord. And so too, we want to enter into the inheritance that you have for us. Lord, it's all about people. It's all about souls. It's about hearts being delivered from hell, guaranteed the hope of heaven. So God, equip us and charge us tonight as Joshua's going to get a little parental on us. That's good. So exhort us and so father us tonight. Sharpen us and send us out once more. Lord, this is exhausting work. God, it it is uh, at times a work that's filled with heartache, difficulty, God. But thank you that all of that only drives us to you. And you refresh us and remind us of who we are, what you've done, why we're here again. And we go back, Lord, and we continue to fight. We continue to swing. Bless these fathers and mothers, these grandparents, these husbands and wives. Lord, strengthen their faith, which is a choice. It's just a choice, a choice to obey. So strengthen that choice to obey what you're calling them and what you've called them to do. In Jesus' name, Father, we love you and we thank you. And we say together in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if this is loud enough or not, David. It seems pretty quiet. Chapter 18, verse 1, book of Joshua. Let's read now together right where we left off last week. Now the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there. And the land was subdued before them. As we said a couple weeks ago, we're in the section of Joshua where some would say it's a little tedious uh, as the major kings, the serious strongholds had been corporately, nationally taken down by the whole army of Israel. It was now up to each and every tribe to request of Joshua their prophetic portion. We'll get into that in a minute. And then to go in and conquer it, subdue who's left, the smaller families and other tribes, the smaller cities and so on and so forth, the villages. But it was the opportunity of the individual tribes to go and fully possess what God had already given them. And isn't that a great thing? So too, you know, we have ministry corporately in the church. Sunday's going to be an incredible day. We've lost count. 20-something, 21, 24 people are being baptized. And I tell you, I could go on and on, but it's a crazy thing to you know, just serve the Lord for a number of years. You should try it. Most of you do simple exhortation there but as as the decades you know go by uh you you see children turn into adults and you remember when that person came and when they got saved and when they got baptized and it's just a crazy thing and that's our corporate work together you know you guys are out in the field every single week and you're inviting and talking and preaching and sharing and discipling and people are coming and they're getting saved and they're getting right with the lord and they're coming back to the lord and they're coming and getting baptized And that's our corporate work. Sunday is going to be just a a, a demonstration of the glory of God. But corporately, that's all our fruit. I get, you know, so much accolade and so much attention. And frankly, I get some of the best blessings in the church. I get to dunk all these guys, you know. And it's, it's just incredible. It's incredible. Stick around long enough and you can dunk them with us. But that's an example of our corporate opportunity, just like the nation of Israel, conquering corporately. Now it was up to the individual. So too, when we say amen on Wednesday night or on Sunday morning, we're now engaging in the ministry, the opportunity that the Lord's given us individually. And you're going back into your marriage and back into your homes and back into your workplace and back into your neighborhoods. And it's your opportunity to conquer individually those areas of the kingdom, as it were, for Jesus Christ. And thus there's that personal responsibility. Boy, 
You know, those that are older in the body of Christ, older in the Lord, oftentimes we want to pass on that personal responsibility, the opportunity of personal responsibility to the young people, right? We want to pass that on. Good, do it. Keep it up. We've talked about that a lot. God gives us all the opportunity in the world, and it's our responsibility to take it, to partner with him, to do something with it, both corporately and, of course, individually. Now, in the midst of all this, as some, as, uh, as some of the land is being, you know, uh, 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 divided by lot, and we talked about, you know, half of Manasseh, we talked about Ephraim, we talked about Judah a little bit. We're now left with the remaining seven tribes, and that sounds a little loud, and a problem seems to have arisen, and that's why the nation now comes together, assembles at Shiloh, because verse 2, there was a problem. Seven of the tribes, which had not yet received their inheritance, needed to receive a little exhortation, a little fatherly motivation, a little you know, smack on the seat of their pants, maybe, I don't know, I'll let you think about that. But before we get there, just consider verse 1 with me for just a moment. I love this picture, it's a beautiful scene. As all Israel comes, they assemble together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of meeting there. And so the congregation comes and assembles around the tabernacle. Um, the tabernacle was their a uh, uh, focal point, the center of the nation, as it were, not only for meeting, it wasn't just the focal point for meeting, but it was the secret, if you will, to their unity. Isn't that great? Coming together, all these different tribes and families, they didn't always get along, and we'll talk about that later as you look into history, but the whole family comes together, they congregate around the tabernacle, not just a, a point conveniently located, centrally located, that they could all come to. But it was also the secret to their unity. And that's an important thing to consider in these last days in the body of Christ. What is the focal point, not just for our meeting, but what's the secret to our unity? And of course, it's just the same as it was for these guys. It's the tabernacle. You know, it's the Lord. It's the word of the Lord, the foundation of truth, the source of of revelation. It's the Word of God. When we come congregate ourselves around the Word of God, as we're so often privileged to, we find our unity. And the problem these days with, with piecemealing and, and tearing apart the Bible and saying, we don't agree with this and we don't appreciate that, and they just lie. Do you know this? Quote, unquote, theologians, they just lie. They actually, some, lie. And they say, well, that wasn't in the original manuscript, or that's not what it means in the original language. And they're lying. They're absolutely telling lies. Because they know, like false prophets often do, you won't pick up a dictionary, you won't research the original language, and maybe that's something to do with us. I don't know. But they just lie. And either way, I'm thankful for what God says in regard to his word. It's never going to pass away. It's always going to remain the same. It's guaranteed of God. He's never going to contradict it, never going to act in a way that's contrary to what we, I mean, everything we have is found in the word of God. And it's the secret to our Christian unity. The more we become a people whose lives are built on this foundation, as Jesus taught us in the gospel of Matthew, this firm foundation of his word, hearing these sayings of his, his teaching and, and walking in them, doing them. We're going to stand securely, strongly, just like Israel. What a beautiful picture of just the congregation all coming and meeting together around the tabernacle, the presence of the Lord, where the word of God was read and delivered and the worship of God was ascending to heaven. A beautiful thing. That's the secret to church unity, to Christian unity. And we need to see a lot more of that, I think, in these last days. As much as we center ourselves around the Word of God, the worship of our Lord will find ourselves unified. And to the extent that we don't, well, we will not find ourselves with much in common. We're a different people. We've got all kinds of differences of opinion on so many things. Lord, give us wisdom. Amen? So it's a beautiful picture that we see, verse 1, but now we get down to business. Verse 2, there was a problem a little dysfunction in this family, and Father Joshua 
is going to deal with this. Verse 2, but there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes. And this is such a, a peculiar circumstance. It's an interesting occurrence. I wonder what the backstory was to this. We don't know, but we'll read what's here and come to some conclusions. Seven tribes had not yet received their inheritance. It was a gift right in front of their face. It was right there, like, uh, you know, the tree on Christmas morning. But they had not received it yet. They hadn't grabbed the present, screaming like children and, and tearing open the wrapping paper all giddy and excited, screaming out loud. Anyway, they had not yet received their inheritance. And so Joshua, Father Joshua, said to the children of Israel, how long will you, what's the word? Neglect, that's what we're dealing with here. This is a problem, and it's your problem, Joshua says, parentally here. As the leader of this people, he's the disciple maker of this nation. So he's got a pastoral authority, a shepherd staff, and he's applying it here. How long will you neglect? This is your problem, your issue. How long will you neglect to go and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers has given you? And then we get into the, the practical portion, the directive from Father Joshua in the rest of this section starting in verse 4, but it would seem as we read this and as we reference a few other places that it was the, the opportunity, it was the responsibility of each and every tribe to come to Joshua and say, where's my peace? Where's my part? And as we talked about, the will of the Lord was determined by dice or the, the, the lot was cast as it were at this time. The Lord guaranteed it. The Lord worked through it. We're going to see that prophetically confirmed tonight as we go through some of the sections passed out to each individual tribe. But it was up to them to come and say, what do I get? What's my peace? Where's my portion? And then, having received that allotment of land, they could go and take it and conquer it, consume it, fill it, enjoy it, receive their inheritance in the Lord. But the interesting thing, of course, is that seven of these tribes, a few of them had, right? We've covered Judah and Ephraim and Manasseh and, of course, you know, the Reubenites. We talked about them as well. But the remaining seven tribes had not done this yet. They're not like Caleb who says, you know, God promised this to me and so I'm 85, but I feel like I'm 45. I look like I'm 25. That's kind of what he said, right? And so uh, give me the portion of land that God promised to me. I went the toughest area where giants are, chariots are a must, fortified cities. That's where I want to be. Give it to me. I'm going to go and I'm going to get it all. See you next week, you know, kind of thing. But these guys, what a contrast. What a, what a difference. How long will you neglect to go and possess the gift of God that, you know, he's given to you? It sits right in front of you and you're just kind of floating around, just kicking it in the midst of the country, kind of bouncing around, you know, here and there, and, you know, I, I've got a piece of land, a parcel of property, I'll, I'll go get it, you know, eventually, you know, I'll, I'll start that, I'll engage in this, you know, when it seems right, when it feels good, you know, and all that kind of thing, and just put yourself in that circumstance for a minute. It's easy to just kind of bounce around, to float around in life, and Joshua parentally, with the authority that God's given him, is saying, uh-uh, I'm not going to let you get away with that. How long will you neglect what God has called you to do? How long will you not do willfully what God has called you to do? But we see a lot of that in Christianity today, don't we? Those who kind of just float around and bounce from church to church, I think, never put down roots, never make some commitments to where they can be faithful and, of course, tested or tried in that faithfulness and really see some good fruit. You know, all the opportunity, the gifts of God are in front of them, but they just say, eh, you know, it's not the right time. It's not the right season. And the days and the months and the years go by and they just kind of float to and fro congregations in different locations and they just never seem to enter into the promised life as we described it the inheritance that God has already given them. And it's just a sad thing. They're brothers and sisters just like us, no less. But they're missing out. Amen? Talking about last night, and, and it's an interesting thing. I'm like uh, reteaching Joshua in our family devotion, and we just covered, you know, the, the long day. 
where Joshua spoke to the sun last night, sun stands still, and it's so cool to teach that stuff to your kids, you know? And how exciting is it to just to realize and remember, as we did, we just covered that recently, that as I'm in the service of the Lord, when I'm walking obediently in what he's called me to do ministerially, I can ask him for stuff and he's going to do it. I mean, that's just super exciting. That's super, super cool, super amazing. Lord, this is what you've called me to do and daylight's, you know, running out, so bring it on. And God's like, okay, you want some hailstones too? You know, rain down some hailstones and we'll make the, how, how, how did God do it? What was the science? We don't know, but it doesn't matter. Joshua asked for the wrong thing, scientifically, you know that, right? He said, make the sun stand still. And God wasn't like, hey, buddy, scientifically, that's not how it works. You know, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, you know? So he asked for, you're with that. So he asked for the wrong thing. It wasn't right. But God gave him what he asked for, what he meant. He interpreted that prayer and, and just gave it to him. It's incredible. All the opportunity in the world. You may not see the miraculous uh, floating about, kicking it back on the couch, being spectators. That's not uh, what Christianity is. It's not a spectator uh, a sport, amen? It's not of a carnival, a carnival ride as we head into heaven. We That's not what this is. But there's a partnership here. There's the miraculous uh, that we can be a part of. And it's just an incredible life that we have the privilege to live. But it's going to take a little work. We need to stay in one place and put down some roots and just engage in the service to which God has so called us. Some blame it on the Holy Spirit. You ever hear that? Oh, the Holy Spirit just, I'm like blown like the wind. Just, you know, the Spirit's like the wind and I just, I'm blown here and over there. And well, that may be, but it kind of looks like you're just avoiding opportunity and, you know, it's time to get serious. It's time to lay hold of your inheritance, Joshua says here. No more. Find and claim your eternal inheritance, Christian. We could say that. Find and claim your eternal inheritance. God's got something to you. He's got a, a, a load of heavenly treasure he wants you to enjoy. Um, and so find out what it is that he's called you to do and just do it till you're dead, you know? That was a little joke, a little church joke, but do it until, you know, the Lord tells you to do something else or Jesus comes for us or, you know, we drop dead and head for heaven. Either way, lay hold of what God has so given you the privilege to enter into. What I appreciate next, and we're going to pull two parental points from verses 4 through 10 as Joshua finds a way to motivate these guys, and I appreciate this as a parent and as disciple makers, that's our job, to raise up those who are younger than us in the faith into ministry. Maybe pull them up to where we're at. And that's why you need to mature and grow. So you can reach down for those of any age that are newer in the faith and you can pull them up to where you are. You can disciple them and invest in them and see that they too engage in what the Lord's called them to do. That's what Joshua does here. And there's two key points that I appreciate as a disciple maker, as a, as a parent. He gives them an assignment, a task. You see, these guys didn't get it, right? And I don't mean this in any demeaning way, but I'm trying to learn as a disciple maker. I pray that we all are. And some people are just different. You know, sometimes the vision goes out. The call is given. We're all called, we say. Let's serve the Lord. Let's preach the gospel. You know, let's make disciples. And sometimes people don't know what to do with that. And that's just a reality. It's not a negative thing. It's an opportunity for us to further disciple God's people. And if they don't see it, if they don't get it, if they don't know where to start or how to begin, it's our job to provide, you know, an opportunity to put something in front of them that they can see, relate to, go and do, and then they might get it. Oh, yeah, now I see, now I get it, now I'll do what God has called me to do. And so we need the wisdom that Joshua seemed to have in the Holy Spirit here. He gives these guys something to do, a task to accomplish. He's kick-starting them, you know? So he says this, pick out from among you. Why does he do this? If not for the point we just made. You don't see it, you don't get it, go scout out the land. 
then maybe you'll get inspired. Maybe you'll have some vision. Maybe the Lord will do something, you know? Pick out from among you three men for each tribe. So seven tribes sitting still when they should be moving. Amen? So pick out three men from each tribe, and I will send them. They shall rise and go through the land, survey it according to their inheritance, and come back to me. And they shall divide it into seven parts. And I like that. This is on them. It's their task. It's their duty. I'll cast the lot, as we'll see shortly. It's all up to the Lord who gets what. But you go and survey the land, separate it into seven sections. They shall divide it, verse 5, into seven parts. Judah shall remain in their territory on the south. We've already talked about them. The house of Joseph shall remain in their territory on the, no territory on the north. We talked about them. You shall therefore survey the land in seven parts and bring the survey here to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord our God. It's God's determination, but here's some opportunity. Here's a task that can get you busy. Awaken your heart, maybe stir some passion, create, cause some vision. I'm going to send you out on a scouting mission. And how perfectly appropriate for those of us in a parental position, for all of us as disciple makers. You know, we don't know what God has called his people to do, do we? God doesn't talk to me for you. To me through, through me to you. Something like that, right? God doesn't talk to me for you. Through me to you. Maybe sometimes, generally, but not specifically. You're with that, right? God's going to talk to you. He's going to mold you. He's going to shape you. And then he's going to call you. And others may bear witness of that. And we could say, yeah, that makes sense. I see that gift at, at work in your life. I, I agree uh, with that call of God that you're saying you have. It seems good to the Holy Spirit that this is what he wants to do. But God's going to call. He's going to talk to you. And so how important is it for us as disciple makers just to give appropriate opportunities for God's people, especially for our kids. We don't know what gifts they're going to have. Five kids, they're all different. It's weird. It's just so weird. And so too in the body of Christ, we're all different. We're just weird. We're, we're all, we're, we're weird. We're all so different. And you know, our gifts are different. And even if we have the same gift, it's going to be manifested in a different way. There's such diversity and that diversity is to be celebrated because we can see the same Holy Spirit of God at work through all us, you know, weird, different people. But he says the same thing, and he looks the same, you know, way. It's a beautiful thing. It's art, the body of Christ, and you know that. We're his workmanship. It's a beautiful thing to the Lord. We are never to be cookie cutter. We are never to sound the same or look the same or copy someone else. What a tragedy plagiarism is, right? Write your own book, you know? Create your own art for God. It's just a beautiful thing. And be free and be blessed in that. Our diversity is something we've got to celebrate. We don't know what call God has placed on our kids or those that we're discipling. We don't know what gifts he's going to give. And so we've just got to, I don't know, put out little breadcrumbs or give little opportunities and just see what the Lord does with it. And something may come of it, and if not, then we try something else, and we just keep going in that process of figuring out for those who don't know and can't see and, and maybe need some help figuring it out. And not everybody's like that. Those who know, just stay out of their way because they'll bulldoze her right over you. That was a joke. They'll take you down on their way, you know, to do what the Lord has called them to do. So just let them go. Just watch out. Let the Lord deal with them. But if they don't know, then provide an opportunity. Vision can be given. Passion can be stirred. And it's so important. I'm trying to still figure that out as a father and certainly grow in that as a pastor. But I also like, secondly, what we see here. Verse 6, Joshua said, You shall therefore survey the land in seven parts. But the Levites have no part among you, for the priesthood, as we've said so often, of the Lord is their inheritance. And Gad, Reuben, half-tribe of Manasseh, have received their inheritance beyond the Jordan on the east, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave them. Then, verse 8, the men arose to go away, and Joshua charged those who went to survey the land, saying, Go walk through the land. 
Survey it and come back to me that I may cast lots for you here before the Lord in Shiloh. So the men went, passed through the land, and wrote the survey in a book in seven parts by cities, and they came to Joshua at the camp in Shiloh. Then Joshua cast lots for them. In Shiloh before the Lord, and there Joshua divided the land to the children of Israel according to their divisions. Joshua gave them a job to do, and what I appreciate so much, secondly, about this section is that Joshua not only gave them a job to do, but he resurrected a skill that they already had. I mean, just read this and, and consider, and you can put the map up on the screen, what a magnificent task this would have been to accomplish. A, a crazy work for these men, these parties, these teams to go in and survey and section out this much land and territory. They didn't learn on the job. Joshua didn't give them a, a little tutorial on how to survey, but it would seem obvious to most Bible students that this was a skill that they learned and possessed from Egypt. And so it was learned, it was a skill that they picked up, you know, 40-something years ago, and that now was being dusted off and, and used by the Lord in a very practical way. I think that's just great. I think that's so important. Oftentimes we get tied up on, you know, what opportunities, what skills, what training we give people. And we're like, oh, that's a waste. You don't need to study math, son, you know, because that's not practical for the real world, you know, or, or whatever. Some of those cliches that we use or some of the things that we say, I don't know how that's going to be useful for the Lord later. Don't go to college, skip school. I've said that before and just get into the service of the Lord. Well, the Lord might want to use something that you're going to learn today, 40-something years from now. And so what we need is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, and, and as the Lord leads us and guides us, as he speaks um, to those in authority over us, and as they give opportunity, maybe it's not our, you know, our greatest desire or our most passionate gift, but take the opportunities that come your way to equip yourself for service in the future these guys were equipped they did an incredible job they wrote it all down in a book i mean the the scene here is just wow decently and in order these guys did an incredible job with the task that joshua gave them and it just screams of the 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 preparation of god no skill from the past is wasted god can use it all in the future in the present and that's something we can remind, you know, those that we're discipling of our kids. You know, patience, son, patience, daughter. You know, pick this up and learn this. You're going to have a practical opportunity to use it later. Trust me, you know. And I know this task might be tedious. It's an important thing as the Lord raises us up, uh, raises up pastors in our midst to go plant churches as we sent out Pastor George, amazing, right, last Sunday. Uh, we're still looking and praying for those that the Lord has called and that he's going to point in whatever direction to go and plant churches. Listen, it's important for a pastor to do everything in the church, to scrub the floors and clean the carpets, to teach the kids and change dirty diapers. I mean, every single thing he needs to learn, she needs to learn. So that when and if the time comes and God calls onto something else or something more or something different, whatever the case may be, been there, done that. Do not despise the day of small things. Amen? Appreciate so much the wisdom of Joshua here, exercising his authority, not berating them, mocking, ridiculing, but just saying enough's enough. He's such a dad here, right? He's such a shepherd. So he gives these guys a practical task to help waken their hearts and open their eyes. He gives them something to do in which they already had training. There was some skill. And these guys killed it. They excelled, right? I mean, just an incredible thing. And so verse 10, again, they come back. Uh, they wrote the book. And it's uh, just a beautiful work. And we're going to continue along verse 11 through chapter 19, the division of these seven sections of land according to the will of the Lord. Verse 11 through verse 28, it's a long section. We see the uh, allotment for the tribe of Benjamin. 
and their territory, their border is laid out, and a picture is worth a thousand words, so there you go, it's a little small, but squint, you can see it. We'll email it to you later, print it out, put it in your Bible, whatever the case may be. One of the things that I love so much about the sovereignty of God, as we'll see in a few of these sections, is that each allotment was perfect. Again, we say the roll of the dice, that's random, not in the Old Testament, not in the Bible beautiful way as these Christians or these believers or followers of God were not filled with the Holy Spirit to the extent that we are today. The will of God is just as serious as it always was and is. And God is guiding each and every decision that's made here. And we see that with Benjamin kind of in a, in a simple but beautiful way. Benjamin, and, and maybe you can, I can't really see the map, but maybe you can. But Benjamin is, is positioned perfectly um, in between Judah and Ephraim. And the reason that that's significant as we look back in history is these were two tribes that were always getting after each other. You know, that, that son uh, uh, or daughter or whatever the combination thereof that never seemed to get along and always had quarrel and fights and issues. Uh, I love that Benjamin here was a peacemaker in between as we look back historically. Um, these two tribes. And it's just a beautiful thing, a good reminder of the positioning of God and His sovereignty. It's always for the health of the body, the health of the family. And sometimes, you know, we can think to ourselves, well, I don't like where I'm at positionally. You know, uh, I, I, my eyes are on another prize, or I want to be in a different place. Uh, may the Lord remind us as we see His sovereignty through each and every section of land that's, that's passed out here. Everyone's essential. Each one is important. Every one is in their proper place. The positioning of a sovereign God is an incredible, incredible thing. And maybe we'll talk about that a bit more as we work our way through these sections. But we see it firstly here with Benjamin. And we can just look back and say, wow, God, you were so wise. Uh, you were so wonderful in seeking to prevent war between these dysfunctional family members. And so, too, we can look back over the years, and sometimes it takes decades, but we'll say always, blessed be the name of the Lord. In heaven's perspective, as we'll see shortly in the book of Revelation, as, as, as the wrath of God is being poured out on the world, the testimony of heaven is true and righteous are your judgments. It's not, oh, God, you're being too harsh. You know, come on now. Tone it down a bit here. That's questionable, or whatever the case may be. No, it's true and righteous. We, we read over and over again, true and righteous are your judgments. It's perfect, because that's who God is. That's what he does. Well, chapter 19, we see the second lot that comes out, and of course, we're dealing with Simeon here, and this is an interesting one. We read in verse 1, the second lot came out for Simeon, for the tribe of the children of Simeon, according to their families, and their inheritance, read this, was within the inheritance of the children of Judah. Skip down to verse 9. We read it again. The inheritance of the children of Simeon was included in the share of the children of Judah. For the share of the children of Judah was too much for them. Therefore, the children of Simeon had their inheritance within the inheritance of that people. It seems at first read, you know, strange, and it seems like a raw deal for Simeon here. Uh, and as you look back in history, you can see that this tribe was, you know, swallowed up by Judah, which was a bigger, a larger, you know, uh, a more prolific tribe. And they kind of just lost their identity uh, to a great degree, being swallowed up by being in the midst of another tribe's, you know, sort of inheritance. Uh, and it seems strange. You can scratch your head until you turn back to Genesis 49, and you can do that if you can turn quickly. I'll read it to you. Genesis 49, wherein, of course, Israel or Jacob is blessing his children, prophesying over them. And when he comes to Simeon, and of course, Levi, verse 5, Genesis 49, he says, Simeon and Levi are brothers, instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man 
And in their self-will, they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. That's interesting, right? So as Israel or Jacob is blessing, uh, 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 prophesying over his kids, he says exactly what will occur and what did occur with Simeon, because, of course, these were some, you know, problematic kids, man. You remember what happened in Genesis chapter 34 with um, Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, um, you know, gets claimed by Shechem and, you know, violated, and it was a terrible ordeal, not uncommon in those days in that time, not excusable by any means. That's why these two brothers decided they'd pull a fast one on the Shechemites and slaughtered them all. And you can go read about that. And Jacob makes comment to that there. Cursed be their anger. It's fierce. This is what's going to happen to these guys. And I think there's something in that. You know, the temptation to give in to anger and rage and how, you know, and what that leads to. I think we could possibly see something of that here. But we certainly see that this prophecy came true as Jacob pronounced it over these sons. And it comes to pass with Simeon. The lot fell on him. And his tribe went there, and they kind of just were scattered in the midst of Judah. Verse 10 through 16, we see the tribe of Zebulun. The third lot came out for the children of Zebulun, Joshua, chapter 19. And a description of their borders given as well. Another great reference. You can put the uh, map back up if you like. But another great reference to the prophecy of Jacob or Israel there in Genesis 49. As the map will speak to us a lot easier than the descriptions here. Uh, these guys were positioned between the Mediterranean Sea and the Sea of Galilee, and thus they had a great opportunity uh, to be involved in the shipping trade. And, and that's exactly, interestingly enough, and you can flip back to Genesis 49 just to reference that, but that, you know, interestingly enough, is exactly what um, Jacob said concerning them. We read about Judah in Genesis 49, verse 8, and that's some powerful prophecy. And we've talked about a lot of that previously. But then he goes on to reference Zebulun. Zebulun, verse 13, shall dwell by the haven of the sea. He shall become a haven for ships, and his border shall adjoin Sidon. And so just a beautiful kind of comparison between these prophecies of Jacob pronouncing these things over his sons and then seeing them come to pass here. We're going to move a little quickly. Joshua 19 and wrap it up in just a bit. Verse 17 through 23, the land of Issachar. The fifth lot, verse 24 through verse 31, Asher, and you can see that on the map there. Verse 32 through 39, the sixth lot, Naphtali. And then here comes Dan. Verse 40, the seventh lot, through verse 48. There's an interesting commentary that we can make here in verse 47, if you'll read it with me. And the border of the children of Dan went beyond these. They were given an allotment, and history teaches us, as this text tells us, it wasn't good enough for them. They didn't appreciate the boundaries or borders that they were given the specific piece of property that the Lord intended for them to receive. We'll talk about why in a minute. So they went beyond these borders because the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem and took it, struck it with the edge of the sword, took possession of it and dwelt in it. They called it Leshem, Dan, after the name of Dan, their father. So the story goes, and we can see a lot of parallels for ourselves and maybe those in our lives today, but they went to possess a particular piece that they were given, again, by lot, granted by God, this is your part, this is your parcel, this is where I want you to be, this is what I want you to occupy. God is sovereign, there's always good reason for his calling, what he calls us to do, leads us to do, the opportunities he gives us to inherit a beautiful legacy in him, preparing for an eternal inheritance. But these guys encountered some difficulty as they went in to conquer the remaining forces, some Philistines, some will say, but it was a difficult area to go in and conquer. They 
They encountered some difficulties as they engaged in the enemy, so they decided rather than to persevere and press on and fight and call out to the Lord and maybe ask for some help, they just said, well, we don't like it here, so we're going to migrate further north into someone else's territory, and we're going to conquer a, a less formidable people. These guys are too tough. We're going to take on, you know, just a, a lighter load, a easier challenge, and that's exactly what they did. They went and found, you know, a weak city or whatever the case may be and avoided the difficulty that they had initially in their inheritance, not trusting that the Lord would deliver it to them. They didn't like it. They didn't want it. So they went where they felt they should go. But we've talked about the legacy of Dan. And isn't that what our lives are all about? The legacy that we're leaving behind. Triumph once, that's nice. But live a lifetime of, you know, accomplishment, faith, fortitude in the Lord. I mean, that's something, right? Things only got worse for Dan. As they were up in a northern area, they were consumed with idolatry, um, always being harassed by the enemies of Israel, the first to be consumed, conquered. Uh, the first door the enemies of Israel would knock on, they just had perpetual problems and great difficulty. And that's always important for us, you know, I think, in, uh, by way of wisdom in our own lives and as we seek to counsel others, you know, where God places us is where God wants us. What God calls us to do, and that's all that matters, is discerning the voice of His Spirit. Each one of our calling, Peter said to the church, be diligent, my brothers, to make your calling and election sure and steadfast, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. I mean, that's an incredible statement, paraphrased a bit, from Peter. Incredible, credible statement. All that matters for we Christians is to what God has called us to do, where he's called us to be, and that's where we stay until he tells us to do something different or to move on or whatever the case may be. But to hear the voice of his Spirit, Circumstances don't dictate a thing for us as Christians. We've got to be careful. Circumstances dictate my move. Well, have you prayed about it? No. I know it seems easier. I know it, it seems like it'll work out better. It's more difficult where you are now. It'll be easier, you know, somewhere over the rainbow. The skies are blue. The grass is greener on the other side. These are some of my favorite jokes because that's how we think sometimes. Did you pray about it? No. It's just, it's the decision we need to make, must make, have to make. Life's too hard. Marriage is too difficult. God's called me to marry somebody else, or I married this person inappropriately, in sin, you know, originally, so God's not blessing it. I'm not so sure about that. The place in which the Lord has called us, where he's led us, where we are presently, that is oftentimes the best place for us. Abide in Christ right where he's called us. Whatever the case may be, in sickness and in health, for better or worse, till death do us part, you know, I think there's something to be said, of course, for marriage there, but also in ministry. And this is important. You know, ministry's hard and service is difficult. But as we talk about this a bit tonight, we're going to stub some toes and break some fingers, you know. I mean, we'll never be consumed, we'll never be killed, but it may get, you know, difficult. And that requires diligence. It requires us to dig deep in the Lord and stand our ground and be faithful. And that's exactly what the Lord has called us. Oftentimes we think that a change and a drastic change will make things easier, but it often does not work out that way. And we just find ourselves uh, digging uh, our hole a bit deeper and things get a little worse. Let's wrap up the chapter, verse 49. Joshua's last on the list, and I like this so much. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, and maybe we'll parallel this text with the example of Jesus. Close there tonight. I love how Paul writes of the example of Jesus gets us all fired up about Jesus and then says, hey, you're called to do the same thing he did, right? We're like, oh. He says, verse 1, chapter 2, book of Philippians, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. 
by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Key verses, he says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Ooh, the key to Christian unity. I'm just glad to be here. I'm just thankful, you know. Not bigger, not badder, not better. But just thankful to be in a group of believers that loves the Lord, to serve those who are better than myself. That's the outlook we need to have. Verse 4, he says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What a family, what a body, what a fellowship such an attitude will create. He, of course, then goes on, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form God, in the form of God, did not consider it robbery or inequality, improper at all to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on the earth and of those under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let this mind be in you. Lowliness of mind, consider others better than yourself. The key to just an effective ministry, longevity in ministry, that humble posture, that meek mindset, that's what Joshua had and that's what we see. As he's last on the list, Everyone received and went in to claim their inheritance. And Joshua, you know, he's the last one to turn out the lights. You know, he waits until everyone received their inheritance. And it was only after that that he claimed and took his. Beautiful example of our, of Jesus. Verse 49 when they had made an end of dividing the land as an inheritance according to their borders, the children of Israel gave an inheritance among them to Joshua, the son of Nun. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked for, Timnith Sarah, which literally means abundant portion, in the mountains of Ephraim. And he built the city and dwelt in it. And then, of course, we wrap up the chapter in this section here. These were the inheritances which Eliezer the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, the heads of the fathers of the tribe of the children of Israel, divided as an inheritance by Lot and Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting, so they made an end of dividing the country. Just like Caleb, Joshua's choice was, you know, big, bad, brutal. It was the toughest that the land had to offer, you know, the fortified cities in the hills, difficult, hard to conquer. And yet, just like Caleb, you know, this faithful guy, this great leader said, give me the, the most difficult spot. Uh, give me something hard to do. Why? Because I want to see God take it. I want to see the Lord do it. You know, this is the guy who called on the sun. Sun, stand still. And God did it. Who took on great difficulties and, and big challenges. Not minor tasks. Not, not, you know, easily to accomplish duties. But he reached big in God, and God blessed him so greatly for it. Lord, so too, stir up in us a desire, Lord, to serve you in difficult things, hard activities, Lord, whatever it is. But just not to be content with, Lord, staying in a safe, small area of ministry, but to say, God, I know you want to do great things in the world today. Lord, sex trafficking in Sacramento, I just am speechless about this, God. We're number two in the country, and I just, it's hard for me to believe. God, I know you want to do something about that. That's big. It's impossible. What do we do, God? Let's take it on for the safety of souls and the glory of God. God, help us to be a people, Lord, who are meditating on your word, listening in prayer, walking through the world with our eyes open to see the challenges, the tough stuff. Lord, the impregnable fortresses, God. And we'll just pray those walls down. 
God, we'll stand and see what you'll do when we take on, Lord, great and mighty tasks um, as you've called us, Lord, and as you guide us, uh, trusting in your provision, your protection, God, that you fight for us, Lord. Lord, speak to our hearts and just inspire us, direct us. God, raise us up as a people, Lord. Um, use us as a, a group of disciplers, God, to encourage those that we have influence over, to, to choose hard things, difficult tasks, because it's in those things that we see so clearly the glory of God. We see the miraculous. What's impossible? Lord, what's untakeable? Lord, bring the walls to the ground like you did in Jericho. Call us, lead us, guide us, use us, Lord, to pick and choose, God, hard things, and to see how faithful you are, Lord, when we just engage as you so called us to. Inspire us, bless us, direct us, Lord, we thank you. Bless your people as we go our way tonight. God, just refresh them. Lord, bless them as we re-enter our week, Lord, and finish well. God, prepare us for Sunday. We are so excited to see, Lord, just dozens of, of your people just taking a stand and declaring that you're the Lord of their lives, that they're dead to the flesh, dead to sin, and alive to you, walking in the Spirit. Bless Sunday with just a special, Lord, spirit of, of love and of fellowship, of koinonia, God, just oneness and intimacy, Lord, is in, in, in who you are and what you've done. Send us out, Lord, in joy. In Jesus' name we say, amen. God bless, guys. If you'd like any prayer, we'll be up front. Enjoy some fellowship before you go. Ask someone as you break goodies. How can I pray for you this week? You are so glorious. With eyes that blaze like burning fire. Jesus, you're glorious. You are so glorious.